Why is the free electron model a good model? The free electron model gives a good insight into the heat capacity, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, magnetic susceptibility, and electrodynamics of metals. The question is, what is the failure of the electron model? Charles Kittel wrote, and I quote, It fails to help us with the other large questions, the distinction between metals, semi-metals, semiconductors, and insulators. Hmm. Now we shall see that there is an enormous profit gained in improving upon the free electron model. Hmm. To understand the difference between insulators and conductors, we must extend the free electron model to take account of the periodic lattice of the solid. The possibility of band gap is the most important new property that emerges. Today's lecture is titled Energy Bands. At the end of the lecture, the student should be able to explain how the nearly free electron model and the chronic penny model serve as an improvement upon the free electron model. The student should also be able to explain the origin of forbidden bands, derive the fundamental result of the chronic penny model, and solve the corresponding plot of allowed bands and forbidden gaps. Name one difference between a good conductor and a good insulator. The difference in terms of electrical resistivity is striking. The electrical resistivity of a pure metal may be as low as 10 to the minus 10 ohm centimeter at a temperature of 1 Kelvin, while the electrical resistivity of a good insulator can be as high as 10 to the 22 ohm centimeter. We see a wide range of 10 to the 32 ohm centimeter, don't we? That's the widest of any common physical property of solids. Now, solids are composed of electrons. We shall see that the electrons are arranged in energy bands separated by regions in energy for which no wave-like electron orbitals exist. Such forbidden regions are called energy gaps or band gaps. Band gaps result from the interaction of electron waves with the positive ion cores of the crystal. Here is a schematic showing how electrons occupy the allowed energy bands for an insulator, metal, semi-metal, and semiconductor. The vertical extent of the boxes indicate the allowed energy regions. The shaded areas indicate the regions filled with electrons. The crystal behaves as an insulator if the allowed energies are either filled or empty. Because if it's filled, then in the presence of an applied electric field, no electrons can move. If it is empty, then there will be no electrons to move even in the presence of electric field. The crystal is considered a metal if one or more bands are partly filled or partly empty. The crystal is a semi-metal or semiconductor if one or two bands are slightly filled or slightly empty. Let's have a brief recap of the behavior of electrons in a cube of edge length L. The obtained energy eigenvalues equal h bar squared k squared over 2n times the sum of the squares of the wave vectors, provided kx, ky, kz equals 0, and also the wave vector satisfies plus minus 2 pi over L, plus minus 4 pi over L, and so on. The wave functions satisfying the Schrodinger's equation and the periodic boundary condition are of the form of a traveling plane wave. The nearly free electron model explains the band structure of a crystal. It explains that electrons experience a weak perturbation due to the positive ion cores of the crystal.
The origin of the gap can be based on electron wave diffraction at the Brillouin zone edges. Remember that the wave vectors from the Brillouin zone center and to its edge must always satisfy the Bragg condition. Electron waves get reflected at the edges of the Brillouin zone provided the origin is at the center of the Brillouin zone. Those electrons away from the Brillouin zone are entirely free electrons, and the corresponding band structure is the left side figure. Energy is proportional to the square of K, as we learned from the free electron model. Now these electrons near the edges will experience interaction potentials delta. The corresponding energy values is the term similar to free electron plus minus the interaction potential delta. The corresponding band structure is shown as the right side figure. The electrons near the Brillouin zone edges are nearly free electrons, but with energy gap at k equals plus minus pi over a. Let's emphasize the Bragg condition for diffraction. Furthermore, the first reflections and the first energy gap occur at k equals negative pi over a and k equals positive pi over a. The region in k space from negative pi over a to positive pi over a is the first Brillouin zone, remember? The wave function at Brillouin zone boundary k equals plus minus pi over a are not traveling waves. The wave functions are made up of equal parts, waves traveling to the right and waves traveling to the left. When the Bragg condition is satisfied by a wave vector, a wave traveling to the right is Bragg reflected to the left, and a wave traveling to the left is Bragg reflected to the right. If you got a wave that travels neither to the left nor to the right, what do you have? That's right, a standing wave. We can form two standing waves from two traveling waves, namely psi positive equals 2 cosine of pi x over a and uh, psi negative equals 2i sine of pi x over a. The probability density is obtained by psi star psi. So we get rho positive and rho negative. Rho positive describes the piling up of electrons, which have negative charge, on the positive ions located at x equals 0, a, 2a, and so on, as indicated in the figure. At these locations, the potential energy is the lowest. Rho negative describes that electrons are concentrated away from the ion cores. Before we leave this slide, let's appreciate figure A. Figure A pictures how the electrostatic potential energy of a conduction electron varies in the field of the positive ion cores. We expect the ion cores to be positive because the atoms are ionized with the valence electrons taken off to form the conduction band. The potential energy of the electron in the field of the positive ion force is negative so that the force between electron and ion core is attractive. The wave functions at the Brillouin zone boundary are normalized over unit length of a line. Review the reading materials to recall how to do the normalization procedure. We write the potential energy of an electron in the crystal as U of x. The first order energy difference between the two standing wave states is given below. We see that the band gap is the Fourier component of the crystal potential. Now we are near the objective which is to discuss the chronic penny potential model. We will need the so-called block functions. Block prove the important theorem that the solutions of the Schrodinger's equation for a periodic potential 
must be a product of a plane wave and a function with the periodicity of the crystal. U sub k of r has the periodicity of the crystal lattice. Under the chronic penny model, the potential model represents an idealized periodic potential of a one-dimensional crystal lattice. We start by setting periodic potential as a series of finite potential wells with finite potential barrier V sub zero so that there is a possibility of tunneling. The wave equation or Schrodinger's equation is shown where U of X is the potential energy and epsilon is the energy eigenvalue. There are two regions of interest here. Region 1 has width A and zero potential. The second region has width B and potential equal to U0. The solution this time has the form as shown with the energy containing the potential U0. We want the solution to have the block form to account for the periodicity of the crystal lattice. By the block theorem, the solution in the region x greater than a but less than a plus b must be related to the solution in the region x greater than negative b but less than zero. The block factor is the exponential function. The constants a, b, c, and d are chosen such that psi and the derivative of psi are continuous at x equals zero and x equals a. These are usual quantum mechanical boundary conditions in problems involving square potential wells. Four equations are obtained. These four equations have a solution only if the determinant of the coefficients of a, b, c, and d is zero. If the determinant is zero, or if we have this equation. The equation is simplified if we represent the potential by a periodic delta function obtained. When we pass to the limit b equals zero and potential u naught equals infinity in such a way that we obtain q squared b a over two equals p or p equals m u naught a b over h bar squared. In this limit, q is much greater than k and uh, q b is much less than 1. So we got a reduced equation here. If we plot the left side of the equation for values of k a with a capital K, the resulting plot is shown, provided p equals 3 pi over 2. The y-axis is clearly indicated to be the left side of the equation, while the x-axis is the dashed line with arrow indicated as Ka with a capital letter K. Now, the left side of the equation is equal to the right side, correct? Recall that the range of a cosine x or cosine ka is from negative 1 to positive 1. Thus, the shaded region are forbidden regions. We can disregard them when determining the range of ka. So, we can indicate these ka values are allowed bands while these ka are forbidden bands. The big K is related to the energy epsilon. However, the wave vector small k of the block function is the important index. The dependent function should lie between positive 1 and negative 1. This determines the range of values of Ka with a capital K, which in turn determines the allowed energy epsilon. The sample plot is shown at the right. Note the energy gaps at the zone boundaries k equals pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on.
We have improved on the free electron model by including the forces exerted on the electrons by the regularly spaced, positively charged, essentially stationary nuclei. The qualitative behavior of solids is dictated by the periodicity of the potential. The shape is relevant only to the finer details. To show you how it goes, we're going to develop the simplest possible case of a Dirac comb consisting of evenly spaced delta function wells. We place one electron in such a periodic potential in one dimension. Then according to Bloch's theorem, the solutions to the Schrodinger's equation for such a potential can be taken to satisfy the condition psi of x plus a equals the Bloch factor and then psi of x. A real solid does not go on forever, and the edges will spoil the periodicity of the crystal, hence the periodicity of the potential, and render the Bloch's theorem inapplicable. However, the amount of atoms in a crystal is of the order 10 to the 23. That's Avogadro's constant. So we imagine that edge effects cannot significantly influence the behavior of electrons that are deep in the crystal. So we can still use Bloch's theorem. We wrap the x-axis around in a circle and connect it onto its tail. Formally, we impose the boundary condition. It follows that e to the i k n a psi of x equals psi of x. This means that the exponential term equals 1. Furthermore, it follows that the capital letter K equals 2 pi times integer N divided by the number of atoms times lattice spacing A. For a Dirac comb, the potential consists of a long string of delta function wells. The wells are a crude representation of the electrostatic attraction of the nuclei in the lattice. We imagine that the x-axis is wrapped around so that the nth well is actually at x equals negative a. Okay? It appears at x equals negative a. It is not a realistic model. We are merely interested in the periodicity. Still, the classic study by Kronig and Penny use a repeating rectangular pattern. Now back to the Dirac comb. In the region x greater than 0 but less than a, the potential is 0. The Schrodinger's equation is given. We let small k to be equal to the square root of 2me over h bar squared. The general solution is written in terms of sine, cosine, and the small letter k. For the second region, x less than 0 but greater than negative a, we apply Bloch's theorem. So the wave function is written this way, and the Bloch factor is expressed in terms of the capitalized letter K. We apply that wave function must be continuous, so we obtain equation A. For the derivative, we have the following assumption. Then from here, we obtain equation B. We solve for the a sine ka in equation a. Afterward, we substitute the resulting expression to equation b. We then cancel the kb term. The equation can be simplified into this fundamental formula. For the chronic penny mo model, the formula is more complicated, but it shares the qualitative features we are about to explore. We simplify the notation by using z and beta. Thus, the right side of the formula can be expressed as f of z equals cosine z minus beta over z times sine z. Shown is the result of plotting f of z versus z for beta equals 1. 
the z values are multiples of pi. The important thing to notice is that f of z strays outside the range negative 1 to positive 1. In such region, there is no hope of solving the formula. Why? Because cosine Ka must be less than or equal to 1. The gaps represent forbidden energies separated by regions of allowed energies. In the Griffith's book, the small letter is related to the energy parameter, while the big letter K is related to the block factor. Within a given band, virtually any energy is allowed. Cosine Ka becomes cosine of 2 pi small n over big N. So Ka equals 2 pi over big N times small n, where n is the huge number, n is any integer. Imagine drawing n horizontal lines at values of cosine of 2 pi n over n ranging from positive 1, that's n equals 0, down to negative 1, or n equals n over 2, and back to almost positive 1. At this point, the block factor recycles, so no new solutions are generated by further increasing the integer n. The intersection of each of these lines with f of z yields an allowed energy. Evidently, there are n over 2 positive energy states in the first band and n in all the higher bands. The lines are closely spaced. We can regard them as forming a continuum, as indicated in this figure. So far, we only place a single electron in our potential. In practice, there will be n times q of them where Q is the number of free electrons for each atom. As a result of Pauli's exclusion principle, only two electrons can occupy a given state. If Q equals 1, the electron occupies half of the first band. If Q equals 2, the electrons completely fill the first band. If Q equals 3, the electrons half fill the second band. If we consider more realistic potentials, the band structure may turn out to be more complicated. The important thing is bands and forbidden gaps exist. Yes, we can say that a band structure is the signature of periodic potentials. Now, if a band is entirely filled, it takes a relatively large energy to excite an electron to excite an electron since it has to jump across the forbidden zone such materials will be electrical insulators if a band is only partly filled it takes very little energy to excite an electron such materials are typically conductors what about doping an insulator with a few atoms of larger or smaller q Q being the number of electrons. We are basically putting extra electrons in the next higher energy band or creating holes in the previously filled band. In either case, the flow of electric currents is allowed. Such materials are semiconductors. So class, you see, in the free electron model, we expect all solids to be excellent conductors because there are no large gaps in the spectrum of energy. Solids are not distinguished into insulators, conductors, and semiconductors. It takes a band theory to account for the remarkable range of electrical conductivities displayed by these solids. Now you know, and as they say in G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle.